Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to today's version of Can We Talk? I'd like to uh, introduce my guest again for the second episode, Paula Overby, who's running for U.S. Senate. Again, nice to be back in Little Falls. <laughs> and she's, of course, running against Tina Smith and Jason Lewis in the 2020 campaign for United States Senate. And uh, I want to, we didn't talk about this during the last episode, but I wanted to mention that Paula has a, a website. Yep, paulaoverby.com. And that's uh, just the spelling of my name, P-A-U-L-A-O-V-E-R-B-Y. And should a person want to make a contribution to her campaign, uh, which, which would be really important because, in my opinion, she's one of these few candidates who can't be bought. She's not, she didn't get big corporate backing for her campaigns. And uh, so it's small funders that will help for her issues to be highlighted and for her campaign to be more noticeable and to get into debates and different things. It's really important. So remember so, that, paulaoverby.com. For any questions or more information, she'd be happy to answer your questions. And, you know, I have to, I have to believe that the, the small, donor, small dollar donor model is the, the future of campaign finance reform. Um, that can happen a whole lot quicker than trying to get our Congress to pass a, an amendment. Yeah, so. that's true. Well, and let's talk about social issues, which we were going to talk about in depth during this episode, and how that relates to, say, um, the issue of being a trans person um, and relating to a job. There's a, a recent article now of August 16, 2019, titled, New Trump Rule Would Let Many Companies Fire People for Being Pregnant, Gay, or Trans. Employers with Federal Contracts may be allowed to effectively discriminate against workers based on the employer's religious beliefs. There's another article sort of tied in with this um, from July 19th, 2019. Uh, in, 2000, in 26 states, you can still get fired for being trans. You can look those up and read them for yourself. But, Paul, I want you to talk about this a little bit. You, when, when I sent those articles to you, we had a little conversation online, and your response was this, and it just blew me away because it's so poignant. In 1878, the Supreme Court in Reynolds v. United States ruled against polygamy, fearful of endorsing a full gamut of religious beliefs, including extremes like human sacrifice. The court argued to permit this would be to make the professed doctrines of religious beliefs superior to the law of the land, and in effect, to permit every citizen to become a law unto himself. And this is the sentence that blew me away. Exactly what's happening in America today. Exactly what Trump is proposing in this policy. And then it's, talk a little bit about these cases and how, they, how important they are to do with this article. Well, I mean, <clears throat> there's a... Uh, we're kind of an interesting history behind that. Uh, I think I sent that to you as well. Um, of course, last year or, or recently, we had the Master uh, Cake Shop versus Colorado. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a case that got a tremendous amount of publicity because mm -hmm. uh, uh, there was a baker that refused to make a, a wedding cake for a gay couple. Mm -hmm. And that went all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, the Supreme Court didn't really rule on the issue of whether or not uh, a public business uh, has to serve uh, gay people. What the court ruled on actually was that the DHS had not applied a strict standard, an unbiased religious evaluation of the case. Mm -hmm. So they, they really uh, skirted the issue, and we can be certain that this issue is going to come up again in the future, unfortunately. But... Uh, I recall back, not long after Citizens United, some people might remember that case, there was a case of Burwell versus Hobby Lobby. Uh, mm -hmm. That's where Hobby Lobby refused, uh, refused to provide, didn't want to provide uh, certain contraceptives to their employees based on yes. their religious beliefs. Right. Hobby Lobby, of course, is a huge uh, corporation with mm -hmm. thousands of employees. Mm -hmm. They are, of course, a public uh, business. 
Mm -hmm. um, and the, the Supreme Court did, uh, <clears throat> actually J uh, Justice Scalia, who many people consider to be a very conservative judge, uh, actually cited that, that Reynolds uh, case back in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. And so they rejected the, uh, initially rejected that decision. Then the, uh, the Congress actually came back and passed the Religious Freedom Act at that time, right? And so that uh, was under the control of the Democrats. Uh, both the House and Senate was under the control of this, uh, the Democrats. So really, uh, it was the Democrats that set up these loose standards of evaluation for these religious freedom laws, mm -hmm. which are now becoming, now being used to attack minority issues such as uh, transgender people, even pregnant women of all things. Mm -hmm. um, we a lot of a lot of women, a lot of us women felt that that was a, a protected domain, right? That we were mm -hmm. safe now. Uh, mm -hmm. Even the issue of abortion, uh, a lot of women thought that that issue was was resolved. Mm -hmm. Well, the ACLU's <clears throat> first issue with this is that the the Trump rule would take that religious exemption and apply it to companies with federal contracts. It's our government position that the exemption exemption cannot constitutionally apply to government-funded employers because doing so would have the effect of resulting in taxpayer-funded discrimination. And this is interesting. Um, half of LGBTQ Americans live in states where they're at risk of being fired for their identity. That's a travesty. Uh, uh, Mind-boggling to me that based on your sexual identity that anybody can be fired in 2019 how can that be that we haven't progressed as humans any better than that in that area uh, yeah I, I mean, and but it's again from my perspective it's really just one piece of a much broader issue right in terms of mm -hmm. of labor and employment today mm -hmm. um, the the, the labor market is becoming uh, much more exploitative, shall I say? Mm -hmm. um, the back in the '50s, '60s, uh, in the period I grew up in, you know, corporations were far more invested in their local community. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they provided a lot of the benefits that we rely on: healthcare, pension benefits, retirement benefits even local community services, mm -hmm. uh, sponsored the local baseball team. Um, but with the migration of uh, technology and wealth to uh, monopolistic corporations, those corporations really are no longer invested in our local communities. Mm -hmm. And I think that's consistent with the rise in uh, all of these issues of discrimination. Mm -hmm. Um, that employers want to be more selective and choose according to their own whims rather than support the values of our communities. And that's not good for us locally. It's not good for our society as a whole. So I link, all, I mean, all those issues are related in my mind. And corporations but, don't also, they don't have uh, any or, or uh, certainly not enough uh, board members who are someone other than a white male Very true. coming yeah. from wealthy background. So a lot of them, they're not representative. Right. But, and the, but the idea that a, a corporation as large as uh, Hobby Lobby, but <clears throat> any, any size company really, uh, can disregard general policies and laws of the United States um, based on some religious belief is, ent is entirely absurd, okay? What is their standard for, um, for establishing that religious belief, right? Uh, you take gay rights, for example, people will uh, cite Leviticus, but, you know, we are not the Levites. And they will cite uh, uh, Deuteronomy. But 
our society, very few people that are going to cite uh, those Old Testament references to discriminate against big gay people are not going to abide by all of the other limitations and restrictions and laws and rules that are defined in those in those books. Right. Well, and including murder. So, in, yes, including murder. <laughs> Let's uh, stone in, them. Including S stoning the women. Uh, yep, for infidelity. Uh, all of those things were permissible and even author uh, condoned at some point in some of that biblical text. Funny, but so, not funny. So they have, a, in my mind, a, a stronger burden of establishing the validity of their religious belief. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's where I think part of the problem is here, is that we have now created a, 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 a policy, the Democrats have actually created a policy of loose interpretation. So mm -hmm. I can, whatever, and, and they want to say that this is my religious belief because I, I self-identified it as my religious belief, but they want to deny me the right to self-identify as a woman, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So, so where is, uh, and my credibility in terms of my belief in myself as a woman has a far more scientific and biological basis than their claim that... Uh, attacking gay people is a religious mandate from God. Uh, there's a certain lack of credibility in that claim. Well, and how, how would our Supreme Court rule, say for instance, if someone of the Satanist belief or Wiccan or uh, any other uh, organization that's out of the norm, uh, let's say for instance if they wanted to uh, discriminate against somebody based on their beliefs of well, let's you know I, I can't even think of the exact scenario but is the Satanist religious organization gonna be given the same precedent value as say the Christian right dominionism uh, you know or the Mormons and polygamy. I mean, that was the original case back in the 1800s that right. they ruled on that if you were just reading. If we're going to err <clears throat> on this, if our judges and legislators are going to rule on religious issues, they are going to have to include all religions and be fair to all of them or lack of religions, a lack of spirituality. There has to be fairness across the board. And I don't see that happening. That would be the context of religious freedom and religious re uh, that's guaranteed by our Constitution. That's very true. I would agree with that. Uh, I don't see that happening, uh, particularly in the current administration and the obvious assault on the Muslim faith mm -hmm. in this country. Uh, but you're right. There's a, a lot of different faiths in this uh, in this country. Um, so that's a very difficult issue. Uh, again, I think that a lot of it really relates back to my principal viewpoint in terms of gender equity, right, and the discrimination against women. I think for centuries, uh, men have uh, treated women like baby factories, right? Like we have a responsibility to provide children for their uh, industrial pursuits for their war pursuits um, and women are not baby factories but the issue that arises today is this one of morality that um, that conception begins at or that life begins at conception um, which is kind of a questionable point of view um, and you see that the extremes of that in some of these recent uh, anti-abortion laws that are actually criminalizing miscarriage, which is uh, a normal part of a fertilized egg that doesn't develop, right? Um, so women are uh, really under assault, I think. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and these religious freedom laws are being exploited to uh, on the front lines of that attack. And it, it does concern me. There are probably monetary issues tied to all of that that we're talking about as well. Economic issues for our country, for states, for counties, 
for city governments even. And, uh, you know, a lot of it, when you, uh, ultimately a lot of it from a political standpoint comes down to that, right? It's like, oh, uh, well, you know, we don't want to pay for it. Mm -hmm. um, but behind the scenes, you look at the desire to defund Planned Parenthood, right? Mm -hmm. So Planned Parenthood doesn't pay for abortions. Mm -hmm. Planned Parenthood funding doesn't pay for abortions. Planned Parenthood pays for women's reproductive health care, right? Mm -hmm. Contraceptions, family planning, preventing unwanted pregnancies, right? Mm -hmm. Avoiding the necessity for abortions. And treating sexually transmitted diseases. And so sexually transmitted diseases. So it's all about women's health, right? And women's reproductive health in particular, which men don't have to worry about. Mm -hmm. unless they're talking about their girlfriends or wives or daughters. <laughs> so is it trans? <laughs> right? Right. And so, 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 they, so men are impacted by this issue. <laughs> mm -hmm. So as a trans woman, you are able to go into a, a Planned Parenthood clinic, if you can find one in the state because they're disappearing fast and furious, to, for health issues uh, I if could. you want to? I could. I, you know, that was one of the interesting consequences of my, di of my divorce. So like I, as I said, I think on the last show, um, I was accused of abusing my son. They put me out on the street. Uh, my uh, son lost uh, parent, you know, lost me as a parent. Um, and that turned into a, a very ugly four-year custody battle that was really based on the bias of the court with respect to gender. Um, and so, again, that it's an example of how my views are informed by my experience of living, of lived experiences in both genders. Mm -hmm. And what happened, halfway through that trial, I, I decided to make that transition. I no longer had those responsibilities towards my spouse, who I loved and respected. Mm -hmm. And she's one of the reasons I didn't transition earlier in my life. But uh, once I was uh, free of that, I did transition halfway through the trial. And that was very interesting, first of all, how the, the totally different response I got from the judges. Uh, it gave me access now to legal services uh, from women's organizations oh, that I didn't have access to previously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and this was midstream. This was midstream, right? Okay. Yeah. So that was really a profound revelation uh, to recognize. Um, those are some of the benefits of the Violence Against Women Act, right? There's mm -hmm. been a lot of funding that have gone into services for women, including legal services. That's why you got involved in all those issues because of your personal experience. It, and very much, very much so. Yeah. So I, I think it's true that the people that fight for social justice are the people that have experienced social mm -hmm. justice. Mm -hmm. I unfortunately experienced it within the context of the family court, but I'm also becoming very familiar with and very much aware of the, um, the misdemeanor court system, mm -hmm. uh, how we utilize that process to basically criminalize poverty to criminalize race, mm -hmm. to uh, to isolate people from participation in mainstream society, to isolate people from voting rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the, the those are all the criminal justice systems issues. And my introduction to that came in family court. Um, so I know that uh, statistically here in Minnesota, majority of counties don't even have a homeless shelter. I imagine you have a lot to say about that. In fact, this county is now because of the efforts of Rose Surma and a pastor here in town, and now oh, his name is slipping me by for some reason. Um, I think he's associated with Bethel Lutheran. Maybe it's Pastor French, something like that. Anyway, their, their efforts are helping to hopefully get the funding here for a homeless shelter, mm -hmm. which we desperately need. Right now, uh, and over the past, we've had um, uh, some of the churches here in town have hosted different homeless groups or people. Um, that was an effort that was a couple of years back. I don't think that's being done anymore. I think our homeless are being shifted to the Brainerd area or to St. Cloud. The Salvation Army has a great big homeless shelter there. But if you want to touch on that a little bit, and then we'll get into the meat of some of this other stuff. 
Well, I mean, homelessness is certainly a growing problem that we don't really hear enough about. Uh, again, I, I attach it fundamentally to gentrification, the migration of wealth, the lack of affordable housing. And the, the way we fund construction and development. But I see that in my own uh, county. I live in Dakota County. We are still in the process of evaluating the extent of homelessness. Uh, I've you know, worked on those panels for a while, a year or two ago. Um, we don't really have uh, established facilities for homelessness. Uh, I know uh, last year, last couple of years, and I suspect it'll be the same this year, uh, we've had these temporary shelters, so people, churches are putting up facilities uh, where people can stay overnight. So every night they can bring in their stuff, every morning they have to pack up and leave. Um, I would like to think that people can imagine how that might be impact your ability to, to maintain your health, to find work, to maintain a job. Uh, well, that's not very homey. It's to not. Be able very, to that's not very homey. Pack up uh, your suitcase every morning. You, know, you have to leave. Pack it's your not suitcase. homey at all. Yeah, and you don't really get a chance to take a shower. Maybe you brush your teeth. Uh, no address. No phone number. No address. No phone number. Uh, I, I mean, I experienced that too when the courts put me out on the street for absolutely no reason at all, uh, based on based on the idea that they're really just want to err on the side of caution, right? So I was in the middle of looking for employment. I'm a contractor. I was between jobs at that particular period in time. I know how difficult that was. I was fortunate that I had a cell phone. I had to go to the library to access emails. I mean, it's very difficult to convince an employer that you're an employable person when you're homeless. <laughs> right. And that's exactly why every city needs a homeless bill of rights like Duluth has. I brought this up in one of my campaigns, yep. I think it was in the 2014 campaign. I begged practically for this city to have a homeless bill of rights. They would hear nothing of it, of course. And that's a travesty because we have a huge homeless population here. And thanks to Rose Surma and Greg Spofford and this pastor, I believe his name is Pastor French, who are exposing this, that we have this issue. They're, they're hidden homeless. They're couch hopping from one place to another. There's a lot or, of that. And, and they're, they're in hiding, just like uh, the different uh, LGBTQIA group people are in hiding because they're ostracized if they come out. Because, yep. And, and the Homeless Bill of Rights enables, um, and I, my information on that is at home. I should have brought it along. I wasn't thinking. But if you look that up, uh, Duluth has a Homeless Bill of Rights. I'm sure it's on their website. And that gives the right so that people have a legitimate address and they, they have a mailing address then and the, uh, other rights so that, because everybody has inalienable rights unless we take them away. <laughs> and we have an opioid crisis here in this area and throughout Minnesota. Um, and that's tied to homelessness. And True. our health care, our... our um, um, we don't, as a society, look at an addiction as a health issue, a medical issue, but we should. It's more criminalized. And, and yeah. if, you, if you don't have a system that allows you to talk openly about what you need to have to control your pain and why you have to take this drug and how it is that you got to using it in excess and or to excess rather because your pain was uncontrollable unless you took more and more of it um, all of that you know. is tied to well, employment I, issues and getting ahead and I'm a, I'm a you know I'm a big uh, supporter of housing first programs uh, I've looked at a number of those programs um, you have to provide people with a stable environment in order to enable people to move forward with their lives. And part of the crisis with homelessness today is that it isn't just single people. We mm -hmm. have entire families oh, that yeah. are living in vans yeah. uh, that are homeless people. And so it's, 
we have this social attitude and this political environment that says, you know, people need to be responsible, they need to stand up for themselves, they need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but the reality is uh, a lot of people don't have the facilities and the resources to do that. And so we're spending a tremendous amount of money because we refuse to deal with the problems, the education gap, the wealth inequality, the issues of uh, addiction, homelessness, we're spending a tremendous amount of uh, money on the back end of that, right? So the social services, mm -hmm. so the detox centers, the police, the incarceration, the mental health issues, the destructiveness of chemical dependency and chemical abuse. All of those things are costing us enormous amounts of money. So, so I mean, it's again, it's where you want to put your dollar. We all know that uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and yet we don't operate our society that way. Don't you think that if we had a system where everyone is guaranteed a certain income that didn't chastise them or penalize them for making then a concerted effort to get above that level? In other words, instead of social service help. Some people refer to it still as welfare. Instead of doing that, if we said everybody gets a guaranteed income of X dollars, and then for those who want to work a second job or be an entrepreneur for some little side venture or something, maybe rake the next door neighbor's lawn or mow their lawn or do something to make a little extra to get ahead so they can bank so they can get up the rungs of, of to get a little more solid footing yeah, financially, know, I'm that, not, that would be a better system. I'm not opposed to, I, it would be a better system. I'm not opposed to a universal basic income. I think it would be probably an improvement over the patchwork of uh, support systems we have right now. Mm -hmm. But it's not where I place my emphasis. Mm -hmm. People need a meaningful, um, need to have meaningful goals and meaningful engagement in their life. And what mm -hmm. we really need is to be able to create meaningful employment for people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hate, would hate to see a movement for universal income uh, supplant a movement for uh, jobs development. So my basic platform is really to reinvest our military spending in social development. Mm -hmm. There is a tremendous amount of opportunity in managing our climate change issues, mm -hmm. in developing new technologies, mm -hmm. in providing the R&D that's going to give us that technology. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we're under, the, under a deadline, uh, and I, a lot of people are starting to accept that. Mm -hmm. But we're nowhere near meeting that deadline. And beyond redu reducing emissions, we need to start reducing the amount of carbon that we have in the air. Like, uh, people are referring to it as geoengineering. Uh, that's where I want to see our investment. That's where I want to see our focus. Um, so I'm not opposed to a universal basic income. I think um, it would be worth looking at how to structure those programs. Uh, I've, I've done some research on that. Um, how do we shift the funding to, from existing social welfare programs to a universal basic income program? I think that would be worthwhile. Um, but my focus is really on creating meaningful work for people. And I think tr transitioning to where we have some peace dividend money to work with, certainly trans transitioning or helping uh, our active soldiers, whether it's in the National Guard or the Navy or any other form of the military service, that those people too will, will, in essence, if we trend away from war, we as a society are going to have to provide a way for them to make a living doing something other than making war on other countries. Very true. Aggressive that's, those, war. That's definitely one of the major transition issues, yes. Well, we've got lots and lots of military people that if we end war are going to be out of a job. And well, why not capture their expertise and their knowledge to help cities, counties, and state governments get a better <clears throat> foothold and help 
transition, we have a program here called Day of Caring, where uh, Camp Ripley soldiers come, and it's probably part of their recruitment retention, but they come here and they go coincide with and work uh, collectively with our high school students and other volunteers to go to senior citizens or disabled people's homes to clean their windows, first level windows, first floor windows, rake their lawns, pick up sticks, whatever they need help with. Okay. If we did a conversion to more peaceful uh, jobs for the military people, they could help turn this city around. And, you know, for homelessness, um, maybe it seems strange, but I think that one of the things that should be considered um, is providing some type of transitional housing, like maybe using a certain amount for people that would want to do this. Why not consider using small RVs as transitional housing for people who would want to go into, I, just thinking of this from my personal aspect, if for some reason tomorrow I got homeless, I, I don't want to go and sleep in a communal bedroom with a hundred other people. Yeah, very few people do, yeah. Then, now that would be a similar to people that are walking the Camino de Santiago. And they can't bring in their Spain. stuff and they can't bring their pets and they can't bring have guests and Right. And mm -hmm. you've got a hundred or more people in a room with snoring issues, with getting up all night long to go to the bathroom, especially seniors like myself. Who wants to be in that environment? I can understand why people would rather have a tent and go camp. At least they've got their little private nook. So why not okay, we we talk about tiny homes or small homes or modular homes. Uh, that type of thing where they at least have their own little compartmentalized living. But why not? We have mobile hmm. home parks in every city. The only difference between an RV and a mobile home is that the, tr the mobile homes don't have wheels, and if they do, they're hidden. Well, I mean, those are the issues of, of housing, right, and how do we provide affordable housing. Every and city I, should have, could have, and should have. And those are an issues. Area like yeah. w in Walmart, you can camp in the parking lot. You can take your RV there and sleep overnight. So why don't we have one district in every city that's just for transitional housing of, in RVs and pop-up trailers or whatever people would choose to pick with their X amount of dollars that they're given by some type of a bank of funding that we, from taking away some of the military funding and turning it over to this homelessness issue for our veterans as well as other people that need access to that money. So they have their little cubicle of space. And if they want to go to a different city for that. the next three weeks, as long as they're not having to shift their kids from school district to school district, it becomes a viable option for them. And, 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 and of course, those options are probably more viable for uh, rural areas than they are for urban areas. But uh, yeah, that's all part of creating <coughs> affordable housing. So, um, and that's really not where most of our money is going uh, in terms of development resources. It's going into high-end housing. Well, and uh, I think you talked about it. I read somewhere that's in one of our emails back and forth, I think maybe, about our existing housing. And maybe this was in a totally separate article, but it certainly ties in. We have a, a, a fair amount of existing housing that could and should be used to house the homeless right now. In every city, we've got repossessed homes or there homes are, that are in the process of foreclosure. Yeah, there are more vacant houses than there are homeless people. Either help those people <laughs> that are the, going yeah. through foreclosure yeah. to stay in their homes to prevent that yeah. bleeding wound from continuing or use those homes for tra transitional housing of our homeless to get them a place at least temporarily to stay until some organization that's government funded like Habitat for Humanity yeah. that's going to put up new housing for people. I mean, why can't we have a government program like that? Like we well, did the I, GI Bill. Well, I can Bill. tell you why. <laughs> Lack of funding. 
Well, I mean, it's a matter of where the funding goes, right? I mean, so right. when you look at the uh, bank bailout in 2008, right. uh, most of us are familiar with that. And the banks will say, well, they paid it back. And it's like, well, if, you know, if I could get a billion dollars to, uh, if I could borrow a billion dollars for a year, I'd be happy to pay it back mm -hmm. uh, because I'd be wealthy by the end of that year. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, and $50 million was allocated from the Troubled Asset Recovery Act for, uh, fighting foreclosures, right? Mm -hmm. I was one of the beneficiaries of that uh, because of the legal action that I was involved in uh, relative to the divorce. Um, I was, their attorney forced us into foreclosure, right? And the way I was able to save our home for myself and my son was through the Troubled Asset Recovery Act, right? So I got a mortgage modification. But that was not a benefit from the government. That mortgage modification was extremely expensive. Right, so I didn't get any free money that I could borrow for ten years or or thirty years. They didn't say, "Here's a new loan for your um, mortgage," at, at, and you don't have to pay us any interest. Mm -hmm. uh, so consumers are not getting the same benefits that their corporate uh, institutions are getting. Mm -hmm. And this is again the separation of wealth in this culture. And I think, you know, people, we as voters need to decide if we're going to continue voting for the extreme wealth um, that our legislature represents, or mm -hmm. if we're going to start looking for representation that actually represents our interests. And that's why I run, to give people that option and to give people, make people aware of that option. How, how many bases, if you for instance, were to become senator, uh, and wouldn't that be nice? Um, how many bases, military bases overseas, do you think we should be closing? And and what would that process look like were you to be this, a senator? Well, how, how many bases do we have? Uh, 800 plus. 800, some 800 bases. Uh, I mean, I don't think that even includes the installations that we're currently developing in Africa. But... Uh, or housing for the uh, military mercenal, mercenary uh, uh, employees like for Blackwater and Halliburton and these other corporations that are taking the place of our soldiers. doesn't include any of that, of course, because they have their own housing. They generally, I, I mean, I don't think that there's a, a, a <coughs> meaningful reason for any of them. Uh, but more realistically... Uh, that's something that's going to be require a transition plan. Mm -hmm. um, that's uh, something that probably is going to require some consideration of the local environment, whether or not people actually want us there. I mean, if we're providing defense services for a country under some mutually agreeable arrangement, then I don't think it's unnecessary or inappropriate for the U.S. to be providing that service. But not in the manner in which we're providing it right now, Could you where see we it? are the supreme command mm -hmm. <laughs> and the it's host country really has no choice about whether or not we're there. Right, it's our you way can, or the highway. You can look at South Korea as a prime example of that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people in South Korea that don't want our anti-ballistic missile systems there. Mm -hmm. And on the islands. So coming up too. Uh, um, so that would be, you know, my proposal in terms of closing <laughs> foreign military bases. Uh, well, I'd like to see if that process begin. Could you envision the possibility of this part of this peace transition if we could ever get there as a nation with leaders like you would be if you were to be senator, where our military bases would convert over to um, peace and social justice initiative type organizations working within that country if we were invited to stay for a certain period of time to help build uh, yeah. issues that were I, important I, And to I them. think that would naturally occur. I mean, it would change the relationship. Uh, I mean, perhaps be more similar to what our embassies are today, right? Right. Uh, and I certainly think that we are in a, a global situation where diplomacy is becoming increasingly more vital to the very survival of the planet, right, and the very survival of the human race. Uh, a lot of people will say I'm over-dramatizing, but at a point 
at this point in time, we need a strong <laughs> emphasis on the climactic changes that are really influencing this planet. Because wars and, hurt the environment. And war is an extremely destructive element in mm -hmm. our environment. Uh, not only do, is the military one of the largest users of fossil fuels, I mean they burn t tons of CO2 every day, but there, war is also very destructive of the natural environment. It's destructive of mm -hmm. the natural vegetation. Mm -hmm. There's an enormous amount of pollution that goes with our military installations. Mm -hmm. There's a, a, a weapons alone. I mean, we abandon uh, tons of weapons. We have weapon systems that are not accounted for. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the military is a very large polluter. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we could definitely do without that. Do you know of an organization called Nonviolent Peace Force? Have you heard of them before? I sorry, I'm not familiar with them. Mel Duncan is used to be at least from the Twin Cities. He founded that organization, and he's originally from Denmark. And the uh, unless things have changed, Copenhagen was their um, secondary headquarters, I believe. Mm -hmm. I invited him. I met him at a speaking engagement down at the library in St. Cloud. And I invited him to come and speak at the Central Minnesota Peace and Diversity Fair, the first one I called. That was my first big action I called in 2012. He couldn't come because he had another engagement, but he sent a gal whose name was um, uh, Kath, um, Freish was her last name, I believe. She came and represented that organization. How they work, and they've been successful in the Balkans and the Caucasus and everywhere, they wear a vest that says Nonviolent Peace Force. They're not armed. And they go in when both arguing parties or warring factions invite them in. When they realize that what they're doing isn't making any headway. It's a form of a mediation services. And these are some of the bravest people on earth, and many of them are senior citizens like myself. They never carry a weapon in their job, what they are expected to do. See, let's say, for instance, a woman has children and she needs to get her kids to school that day. And so she walks her kids from her home to the school. Their job is to help intervene and walk with her. And if she uh, is successful getting them to school and wants to go let's say to a restaurant to have a cup of tea or something. The nonviolent peace force representative sits in the restaurant close to them and positions themselves between that person and the doorway so that if a, an enemy of them would come in and try to attack them, they take the hit. They stand up and represent and, and protect that person. That to me is real bravery. One of my first signs said, and I still have it in my garage, um, the, the bravest among us do not carry guns. And there's great well, truth in that because if I had a is, gun on me now, right here in this room, and somebody came in here with a shotgun, I would have less fear, probably, because I could defend myself or you, because I'd have a gun, I could shoot him down. But then the real challenge is how would I defend myself or you, or both of us, without a weapon. That takes real courage, that takes real creativity. And there are people amongst us that are willing to do that. And I actually talked to Camp Ripley back when Major Jim Donovan was the public relations director. I asked him seriously to consider allowing nonviolent Peace Force people to come and train them on the same techniques that they're trained on so that we could get away from the military thinking the only way they can protect somebody else is weaponry. Yeah. Now, what's wrong with that idea? Well, yeah, and I mean, that's the <laughs> narrative we've been living with in America for a long time. It's uh, mm -hmm. like de-escalation policies as well. Right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, um, same thing. The, uh, and, you know, I experienced that back in the 70s even, a similar type of thing with domestic violence. Um, the, I did work on police studies, metropolitan police studies, uh, mm -hmm. interviewed police, rode around with police, uh, documented uh, their actions. Mm -hmm. And of course the most common, I worked evenings which may be somewhat biased, but the, the, by far the most common call was a domestic dispute. 
and the most one of the most uh, treacherous situations for a cop to get into. Very true. Yep, and they hated those calls. Because uh, they really in part risk. because they they really had not there was really nothing they could do to intervene. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was obvious that certain things needed to change. Um, but now we're kind of moving in the opposite direction, right? Mm -hmm. Where the police have too much authority, not enough training. Um, certainly on mental health issues, that's and true. And certainly on mental health issues is an even better example. Uh, there have been some, some good initiatives in terms of providing uh, mental health counseling services to be with police. Uh, those are progressive programs. There's far too few of them. But, yeah, uh, that, that mentality has been with us a long time. And, you know, the, our foreign military policy really continues to enhance and, and support that type of thinking. Um, you know, again, I mentioned the 1033 program and the, the dumping of military surplus on our police departments. That does not promote a positive social interaction between police and community. Correct. And effective policing really does require effective engagement with the majority population in that community. Mm -hmm. And if they don't have a positive relationship with the community, then they're not going to be able to do effective policing. And this is precisely what happens in communities of color. They are not perceived as protecting the community. They are perceived as a threat to the community. And more <coughs> often than not, that is the truth. So switching topics a little bit here, I want you to touch on a little bit uh, your view on PolyMet and the environment uh, here in Minnesota as well as ah, here yes, in Polymet. You know, I feel like we're we're making some progress here in Minnesota, but uh, it's most of it's happening in the courts, and this is, I think, uh, from a political perspective, has been an unfortunate pathway that we've been going down in terms of uh, activism is relying too heavily on the courts uh, rather than developing uh, effective legislation. But the PolyMet situation, I've, I've blogged about this, you can find uh, more detailed information on my website, but is uh, a, a, first of all an, an enormous risk to the environment. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that. There's going to be substantial mm -hmm. and, uh, damage to the environment. Mm -hmm. and, and that's traceable already from actually from the iron mining, the taconite mining. Right. The sulfide levels in our water and the mercury levels in our fish uh, ultimately come from the iron mining. Mm -hmm. uh, that problem is going to be substantially worse mm -hmm. with the copper mining, copper sulfur, hard rock mining. Mm -hmm. uh, so <clears throat> I don't think that's even a question in my mind. It's definitely not. But the, uh, the other thing that I find uh, disturbing about the polymet uh, or the North Shore mining issue is just the time frame involved. Uh, particularly right now, copper prices are, are reasonably depressed. Mm -hmm. And so PolyMed is talking about a huge scale operation over a very short time frame to pull out virtually all the copper in that region, uh, which is going to create a, a, a vast oversupply in, in the market. I hadn't thought about that. And so there... And, and so it's going to be a boom and bust, right? So they're talking about a 20-year cycle. So that economy is really just starting to uh, realign itself after the iron bust, you know, mining bust. Uh, they've developed new economic alternatives. Now they're going to bring in mining. They're going to have a 20-year boom, and then they're going to have another bust. And again, that's not good long-range planning. Mm -hmm. My perception at this point, given the idea, given the fact that we really don't need that copper right now, mm -hmm. uh, we could easily put another a 10, 20 year moratorium on that on this issue, and revisit it 20 years from now. Now, I don't like the idea of kicking things down the road, but I think the future generation is going to have a better perspective on climate change. They're going to have some of their own people representing them. They're going to be in a better position to make reasonable choices about what to do with that copper. Rick That's Nolan. my position. Rick Nolan always said, mm. um, 
that we, we shouldn't be depending on foreign countries and uh, basically slave labor of, and even involving children to harvest our minerals that we need for military use as well as domestic uses. In other countries, we should be getting it ourselves right here so we have more protections on it. That's a, that was his <clears throat> argument. That's a classic scare, scare tactic. Uh, you know, we've been hearing about national security. I mean, we, <clears throat> we heard that argument with fossil fuels forever. Uh, now we're a leading exporter of oil, actually. Um, we, one of the things, uh, strategic military uh, operations is protection of the Persian Gulf, right? Because we're protecting the global oil spigot. Mm -hmm. You know where most of that oil is going, actually? Mm. China. Roughly 50% of the oil coming out of the Persian Gulf goes to China. And so we're using our military to protect their interests. To protect their interests. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it works out, actually. <clears throat> but it's, it's, it, but it's, we're protecting our own interests, too. You know, uh, The U.S. has definitely been in control of the oil markets for a long time, and they want to stay in control of those markets. So talk about, <clears throat> for probably the remainder of time here, um, and we must have at least 10 minutes left, I'm not sure because I don't think his clock is working right. Um, what would you do differently, do you think, than either Tina Smith or Jason Lewis were you to become our senator? Well, first of all, I'm a representative of the common, common people, <laughs> like 80% of us uh, that work every day, that work two jobs maybe, three jobs, uh, that are struggling with student loans, that are having trouble getting access to health care, I would represent those people. Instead of uh, the corporate so, interests. That, instead that of the corporate interests, right. So my emphasis is on rebuilding and, re and empowering local communities. And that's especially critical to uh, rural areas, right. Mm -hmm. the, the corporate migration of wealth and, and the corporate empire has really decimated Main Street America. And, you know, the, the popular narrative is that that's just the way it has to be, right? How else can we feed the world if we don't have Cargill and Monsanto uh, polluting the environment? But the reality is uh, small farming, uh, permaculture, uh, organic uh, agriculture uh, provides jobs. And the idea that people don't want to farm is uh, another false narrative. The reality is people can't afford to farm. That's true. And, but, uh, but small farming is infinitely more productive than uh, monocrop farming. And mm -hmm. it's uh, considerably <clears throat> less harmful to the environment and considerably less wasteful of very important resources like water. We even talked about uh, cooperatives and your feelings mm -hmm. about those and how those might advance, say, for instance, farming or manufacturing. If we were to be uh, having more of our jobs based on a cooperative philosophy rather than a capitalist type yeah. philosophy. And I mean, that goes to the issue. I know you were asking me about it earlier, but I don't know if we had time to talk about it. Five minutes left. The, uh, <clears throat> the issue of how we finance development. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a, a, a big supporter of cooperative uh, in, uh, environments. Um, I, I definitely think that we need a broader uh, ownership uh, at the local level, and that has a lot to do with funding. So, for example, uh, you know, I'm an investor in cooperative en energy futures. Um, we, the issue becomes how do you fund these large-scale projects? And the only kind of funding resource that's, major funding resource that's available today is uh, tax credit financing. And the only people that can get uh, benefit from tax credit tax financing, financing is very rich people. Yes. Uh, we need funding models that allow average people to invest in large-scale projects and cooperative uh, projects. Cooperative housing, cooperative farming, uh, cooperative energy. Um, I mean, the rural electrical uh, electrification project was a prime example. 
mm -hmm. of a cooperative of that a worked. cooperative that worked. And, and it is a type of socialism, but people shouldn't be afraid of socialism because that's how our police force is based. Yeah. It's a, a socialist model. It's not socialism. Our school system it's is. It's community engagement. It's right. people working together. Right. But it's that, mm -hmm. that concept has gotten a bad rap by it people has. having a negative I, uh, ideal, idea, ideas or thoughts to do with that because they think, oh, oh my God, you know. We hear from Trump especially, the United States will never be a socialist nation. Well, why do we have a socialist organization called our military? Yep. It's the biggest so, organization. So I can tell you, you know? that Jason Lewis and Tina Smith are not going to support any of those initiatives. Mm -hmm. They're not going to support a reduction in our military budget. They're not going to dis dis support uh, distributed uh, cooperative financing options. Mm -hmm. um, they're not going to support a major uh, energy initiative or Green New Deal. Mm -hmm. They're not going to support major changes in our uh, public transportation systems, our infrastructure systems, and our health care systems. Um, Tina Smith will probably make some promises in that regard. She'll talk about health care. They talk about the high price of prescription drugs. Mm -hmm. um, what are they going to do about it? And they won't give you many answers in the debates. They won't give you many answers. I mean, a simple thing like drug prices would be to allow Medicare to negotiate drug prices. Mm -hmm. Why do we have a law that prohibits them from negotiating drug prices? Mm -hmm. That's a government that's uh, supporting corporate interests and corporate mm -hmm. profits. And that so. would change under your leadership should you become our next senator. The messaging will definitely change, yep. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'll probably be working with the, with the squad, maybe folks like Bernie Sanders. Um, you know, we need a country that represents the people. Mm -hmm. So. Well, I thank you for uh, making the long drive up from Egan and, and visiting with me today so our viewers can get a little... Uh, touch of what you would represent uh, in the Senate campaign coming up here in the election and I want to invite you back to come and visit again maybe mid-year some you know July August again maybe yep. even June to come that back and talk great. about things uh, maybe there will have been some debates by then I don't know how how long so it takes to get into those but we can talk about how those socialist <laughs> policies are going to benefit your conservative uh, audience <laughs> <laughs> Because I know a lot of your audience, I know this is a, a very solid uh, Trump uh, mm -hmm. voting block, mm -hmm. and so there's a lot of uh, anxiety and fear about uh, those types of policy discussions. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's going to benefit the rural communities more than anything. Mm -hmm. So. And uh, if there's anything you want to just share in the last minute or so that we have here, I'll give you. The oh, floor. I thought that was my last minute. <laughs> Uh, you know, again, I you know I want to I, I want to emphasize uh, campaign finance uh, and and voting with your dollars. And uh, if we support candidates that are not that are representative of our interests, of the people's interests, uh, which is the majority of us working mm -hmm. people, um, that keep this country operating every single day, then we need to support candidates that represent us. And the way to do that is with small dollar donations. Mm -hmm. And you can contact and, uh, and make your small donation if you like at PaulaOverby.com. Yep. And so a dollar, five dollars, twenty-five dollars, whatever you contribute to a campaign that represents you, is supporting that message. And that's what's important is is, is the messaging that we're creating. And thanks again for coming, Paula. It was a well, pleasure thank you to for have the invitation. you. And Look forward to you coming again, and thanks to our viewers for having an open mind and watching, and hopefully you've learned something over the last couple hours. I know my experience in meeting Paula for the first time today and talking with her over the last few weeks here has been really eye-opening, and I appreciate you coming, and hopefully this will be like a, an icebreaker in this community, and uh, we'll have some real positive results in the future, and I'm happy well, to welcome I've, you back. So far, I've experienced a very warm, welcoming community. So <laughs> maybe I'm, I'm just not finding the right people. <laughs> well, 
Well, thank but you thank so you. much. Thank you, little Paul. And well, thanks to the viewers to for watching, and stay tuned for our next episode. Thank you so much. We're out.